This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail-order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. It's Friday afternoon. It's a beautiful day here in Perth. I hope it's beautiful where you are in Australia. And we are here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to share some great gardening advice with you and to answer your gardening questions. And it's very important that uh, when you do post your questions, and I hope you do, that you let us know where you're from. It's really important that you tell us the state, ideally the town or suburb that you're from. It will help me enormously as we go along. Now, we are live streaming today uh, through the Garden Gurus, also through Love the Garden Australia, Garden Express's Facebook pages, and of course, our YouTube channel as well. So there's lots of opportunities for people to engage. We really hope that you will do that with us tonight. Um, what we're hoping to do is answer as many questions as we can, but also introduce you to uh, a bunch of pretty interesting people. Uh, the first one is uh, is a bit of a regular, and uh, he didn't join us last week, and I missed him a lot, but he's promised me he'd come back. David Van Berkel from Garden Express. He's got a fantastic gardening offer for you. And remember, Garden Express is the garden centre that delivers direct to your doorstep. You don't have to get out of your armchair. You can just place your order online. Um, and we've got uh, Dr. Catherine um, Bondono. Now, she is a very interesting lady. She's been conducting some research in regards to apples and the health. And you know the old story, apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, this is going to be a pretty uh, interesting chat. So I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. And um, of course, yeah, the thing is, post your questions uh, on our Facebook page. If you like the answers, if you like what we're doing, please press like to let everybody know. Now, we will get into the questions straight away. And first up, we've got Linda from the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, mop head hydrangeas. Now, they are absolutely gorgeous. I've got one in my garden at the moment, and they are really good. Um, what is the best feed for them? You've had the bluest ever this year, and I think it's all the rain you've had, and it probably is, Linda. Now, as far as feed goes, so... Hydrangeas are quite famous because their flower colour will change depending on the pH of the soil. pH, potential of hydrogen. So it's basically the number of hydrogen atoms, which means that it's either acid or it's alkaline in simple terms. The more alkaline it is, it's going to be pink. The more acid it is, it's going to be blue. So it suggests that your soil is probably quite acidic. And that's that's great. It's fantastic if you love blue. But if you do want to change them, you can change a blue flowering hydrangea by adding some lime. It's such a simple little premise. It's a really cool thing. So uh, I would suggest to you probably right at the moment, they are really just about finished as far as their growth goes. And feeding is probably not something you need to worry about. In the next month or so, um, you're going to find that they start to get a little bit of colour coming through them, through the foliage. And of course, they're deciduous, so they'll eventually lose their leaves as we move into winter. So I don't think I'd feed them at all. I think I'd leave them now, let them start to feel maybe a little bit hungry as they go into dormancy. When they burst out in spring, the first thing they're going to do is, of course, produce a lot of flowers. So that's, um, that's my advice for you. Linda in the Blue Mountains. Joy from Northern Victoria. What is the best fertiliser for lily pillies? Lily pillies are a gross feeder. So uh, if you're talking about the hedges, it's going to be something that's reasonably high in nitrogen. So you want to see lots of growth of foliage and nitrogen is going to assist with that. So as long as your fertiliser has got a, a pretty good nitrogen ratio, that's the first thing. The second thing is that 
lily pillies are a little susceptible to scale insects and some of those problems and building up their resilience building up their cellular strength stops a lot of these pests being able to damage them so um, it's always good to have a good all-round fertilizer and uh, using a controlled release fertilizer that's got a lot of trace elements so make sure you're looking at your fertilizer bag you're going right i want to make sure i've got trace elements i'll give you a good example got some performance naturals here this is the all-purpose and when i have a look wherever it is at the ingredients you can see this is the guaranteed analysis of what you're going to get and there's a whole range of essential micronutrients that are vital to health and it's the same as us it's kind of like us needing to have um, magnesium in our diet or iron in our diet because we've got a deficiency or making sure that we're keeping our calcium up so that we don't get brittle bones as we get older exactly the same concept well-balanced diet you should be fine so i hope that helps um, let's keep moving along keith how do you get rid of stink bugs on citrus well two bricks that'll do it but to be quite honest and i'm being silly there um to be quite honest the the thing with them is that they do not like um they do not like pungent um odors so this is one believe it or not because of course they're called stink bugs because they create it themselves but if you put garlic and maybe mix it with a bit of chili as a spray over the foliage you'll find they'll all move on they won't hang around at all they do not like that one bit now i should tell you that uh, Lockie is producing today and Lockie is far more generous than michaela so he's got six packets of seeds for uh our our questions of the week and he'll pick them out and let you know afterwards so hopefully he sets a standard for michaela for the future anyway we better get back to work hadn't i just remember you are in the running to get a packet of seeds for your question but you do have to make sure you tell us where you're from brad from unknown uh what's the best way to achieve best results for your potted plants well brad right at the moment one of the best things you can do is actually repot into some fresh potting mix um, really really good for potted plants to be knocking some of that soil out now after we've got through the peak of summer and as you move into the autumn you'll get some really nice steady growth but only if you've got fresh potting mix in there, only if you've got fertilizers in there, and that'll really help. I hope that helps you. Uh, Keenan's on YouTube. Hello, Keenan. What a week. Hope you guys are okay. We're very good over here. It's certainly crazy times at the moment. We have been through some pretty, uh, pretty strange times, but um, it's the world we live in, and there's no better way to um, get over the challenges that come at us than jumping into the garden. So I hope that you're all able to do that because it's it's good for the soul and uh, it's certainly good for your health. Now, I've got, a, I've got a product of the week that I wanted to show you. I'm not able to catch up with the guys from Love the Garden this week, but I was just showing you a fertilizer before um, Performance Naturals. Now you can see this, this is the soil improver. So if you're going to be doing any planting in the garden and autumn is the time to be planting, it is the best time of the year to be getting plants into the garden make sure that you're using some of this it's soil improver so if you've got poor soil it doesn't matter whether it's a heavy clay or a sandy soil mixing this into your planting mix actually mixing it into the soil um, will get the plants off to the best best start and the reason is you see all those those little symbols at the bottom of the bag well they represent different things different benefits that plants can enjoy including something called nature n which is a unique natural nitrogen that promotes it acts quite fast and, and promotes rapid growth but it's completely natural it's got blood and bone which is very very good and that's high in organic nitrogen and phosphorus of course and that's really good for one both leaf growth but also most importantly for root development and it's also very high in calcium which is vitally important if you can grow some of those um, solanaceous plants things like tomatoes chilies um, capsicums any of those guys and uh, some of those other things, seaweed, it's got biostimulants, which is getting the microbes healthy in the soil. It's got chicken manure, it's got feather meal. And the thing with this is that if you're putting vegetables in, for example, in your garden at the moment, um, you would be using that. And just to let you know, you know, if you think that this is good for your plants, take a look at Nigel Ruck. I'm, I'm, you can see him in action at the moment. Wow, is he looking fantastic at the moment. I think that he's been getting into a little bit of this performance natural stuff himself. Look at him. Look at him. What a man. What, what a spectacular 
human being he is. I'm never, ever, I've never been so dazzled as I am currently with what Nigel's doing. Look at that. And he's out there and he's spreading it in his garden too. Sorry, Nigel, giving you a bit of a hard time there. But Nigel and I, if you haven't worked it out, we love doing that on the show. It's all part of having the fun. Now, um, if you do want to get your hands on the Performance Naturals range, all you do is you head into your local Bunnings store. They carry it and that soil improver. The point of showing it to you is really saying, look, after a long, hot summer, um, your soil is probably going to need a little bit of replenishment. And as we get moisture levels back up to quite a reasonable level in our soils as we move into the autumn and, and the rainy season in most parts of the country, putting those organics in, using a soil improver when you plant, really is sometimes the difference between success and failure. And certainly it gets your plants off to the best possible start. So I'm, um, I'm pretty keen to, uh, to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And, and that's what you should be walking out of your local garden centre with if you're buying plants to put into the garden at the moment. Now, let's keep moving through questions. Tanil, you didn't tell us where you're from, but it is an olive tree question, so I should be able to get my way through this. Um, my olive trees have only produced olives once since I bought it nearly three years ago. Now, they only produce every few years or so, or do they only produce every few years um, or so? And the answer is that olives, if you treat them mean once the tree has been established, and what I mean by mean is you back off the irrigation during the summer months, you will find that they'll produce a lot more flower. The only other thing that really affects the flowering with olives, well, there's two things with regards to producing flowers. One is olives actually require a chill factor. And everybody thinks of them as a, you know, as a uh, Mediterranean fruit. Um, but to actually get fruit set, you do need to have some cooler conditions. That's why you don't see olives right up in the, the north of the country and why they grow so well inland of so many of our capital cities because they can get those cold frosts during the winter, which triggers a good flowering and good fruiting as a consequence. So that's, the, that's probably the major thing there I would say to you is that keep your eye out with regards to temperatures. That's one thing. Don't overwater them, don't overfeed them because they'll just grow happily. They don't feel threatened in any way and therefore they don't need to reproduce and therefore they won't produce flowers and fruit. And uh, Mother Nature is a wonderful thing like that. Um, so it could be any one of those things. I hope that helps, Tennille. Um, Carol is in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. Love that part of the world. Absolutely beautiful part of the world and some nice wineries down your way too, Carol. What type of conditions does a king pink protea like? Okay, interestingly enough, the king proteas, the, the big pink flowering forms, and there are some others as well, a, a nice white I've seen out there, I think a couple of other colors that are available. Um, they really do need a free draining soil and a bright sunny position. And they do require a little bit of irrigation during the summer months. A lot of people think you treat them just like a native plant, but they're not a native, they're a native to South Africa and where they grow, naturally, they do get some summer rain. So you will need to irrigate them to keep them um, really growing well. But uh, yeah, bright, sunny spot. And don't plant them too close to each other as well. They do like to have a bit of airflow movement through the plant. Helps avoid some of those fungal problems that they can sometimes get. So I hope that helps you, Carol. They should grow well in the Mornington Peninsula. I think the best proteas um, that are sold in pots come from uh, two of Australia's best growers which are they're located in uh, the dandenongs in um in victoria i hope that helps now cheryl is in the southwest of wa what is a good indication that your apples are right before you pick them it's a very good question and we're going to have we've got a couple of um of of apple questions and i think i'm i'm going to um I'm going to probably go, I think, to our interview with Dr. Catherine Bondono. And the reason I'm going to do this is because we're talking about apples, aren't we? Hello, Catherine. Welcome to the show. Hi, Trevor. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm, um, I'm a massive fan of apples as a fruit to grow at home. But there are so many um, stories about them and, and sort of these almost myths that have been sort of arising in recent years that I thought it was a bit of research that I saw that you've completed recently was just fascinating. And uh, I can remember you know, being told as a kid that um, uh, peel the skin off the apples because the flesh is, is all good for you. Um, then being told later on, no, no, actually all the goodness is in the skin. Uh, there's so many different stories. 
apples, the longer they're stored, the less nutrient density and value they have. These are all things that I've never really been sure of the answer. But you've been doing a lot of pretty fascinating research into apples recently, haven't you? Yes. Yes. We've been researching apples now oh, for 11 years. Oh, okay. Now, I think we got, we've, got a, we've got a little technical issue going on, Catherine. Um, would you mind doing us a quick favour? Could you close the link and rejoin us? We've got, a, we've got a vision problem with you at the moment. So would you mind just doing that? And that will hopefully have you rejoin us in just a second. Okay. Thank you. In the meantime, I might, um, I might get to those questions that Cheryl's asked about uh, the indication of when your apples are ripe before you pick them. First thing is you'll see this, the fruit is full size. That's probably the most obvious thing, but you will see a change in the color. So if it's a, if it's a green apple, um, you will see it get a lighter green shade as it's getting closer to, to ripe. And the funny thing about apples is of course, you can actually pick them and they will ripen if you pick them green or a little bit early as well. So you don't have to worry about that too much. Steve's in Perth as well. And he wants to know, should I be giving my apple trees? Or should I be giving them now that they've had fruit? Well, certainly as, as fruit trees produce their fruit, um, you don't need to feed them whilst they've got the fruit on the tree. That's, um, that's one thing that you shouldn't do. When the tree has, when you've harvested the fruit from the tree, great idea to, um, to go then. I think we've got Catherine back with us. Hello, Catherine. That's a lot better. Thank you so much. Yeah, can can hear you and see you. It looks all fantastic. Now, Catherine, tell us about your research with um, with apples and um, those are quite surprising outcomes with regards to colours. Okay, so our research into apples really started with our interest in heart disease, which is really one of the leading causes of death worldwide. Yeah, and really, um, one person every twelve minutes will die from heart disease. One person so, every 12 yeah, yeah, so that's um, information put out by the Heart Foundation. So because a lot of people have a risk factor for heart disease, we're really interested in reducing risk. So one of the things that reduces risk we know is diet. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of evidence behind a compound in the diet called flavonoids to reduce the risk of heart disease. Now, our mm -hmm. lovely little apple is actually one of our major sources of flavonoid intake. So that's where our interest in apples started. So, so is, that, is, that where the, the, is that possibly the link to the uh, the old saying about an apple a day? Yes, absolutely. It, it's yeah. probably true because a study that we did showed that when we looked at Perth women followed for a number of years, over 1,400 women, those who had an apple a day had a 35% lower chance of dying. 35% chance by having lower an chance. apple a day. By Lo having an apple a day. day. Yes. That is phenomenal. Yes. So also we conducted a number of clinical trials at the Royal Perth Hospital Research Foundation here where we gave volunteers apples to eat and then we did measures of their blood vessel health and we saw, saw improvements within a few hours of intake. And we what? were very clever in the way we we went about this, if we may um, pat our own backs, was that we gave our volunteers apple with the skin and apple without the skin because the flavonoids are concentrated in the skin of the apples. And we saw the effects with the apple with the skin. So the apple so we, with the skin was definitely better in regards yeah. to the effect it had on the blood vessels. Yes, yes. And that's where you, the you, flavonoids are concentrated. They're in the skin of the apple. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of different coloured apples out there. Um, so does that sort of have an effect? I know with, say, carrots, for example, you know, we talk about vegetables and we talk about the intensity of goodness that sits in, say, a purple carrot versus an orange carrot or a yellow carrot. Is there a variance in the intensity of goodness that's sitting in apples? Yeah, so we screened about 91 apple varieties grown here in Perth for their flavonoid content. And we did see great variation. Now, some of the flavonoids do have a color associated with it. So that's the anthocyanins. So mm -hmm. if you look at the apple, like the Bravo apple, which is really a deep purple, that's yeah. the anthocyanin content. But not all flavonoids have a color associated with it. So another apple like the Pink Lady is also high in flavonoids, but doesn't have that deep, rich color. 
Okay. So, so pretty much what you're saying here is, is a general comment, the darker the skin, the better the apple is probably for you. Is that, is that a good assumption? Not, not necessarily. (laughs) Yes and no. Yeah. Because not all flavonoids have a color associated with it. Okay. Yeah, so that's why we tested all these apple varieties to actually fully understand that. And so tell I can me, say that the, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was going, I was going to say. So, so tell me, what what was the outcome? What were the apple varieties that that you would list as maybe the top five varieties that people should consider making sure they do have? Well, our standout two apples were the Pink Lady and the Bravo Apple from mm. West Australia. Those are our yeah. two standout ones yeah wow so they, they were number one and number two and yeah. obviously yeah, bravo is it's almost black you know it's such a yeah. dark color on the skin there isn't it yeah and that's yeah. the anthocyanin content within the bravo apple which is a type of flavonoid so if you were just eating the skin is that good enough by itself or is it the combination of flesh and skin is better for you I would recommend the combination because within the apple itself is a whole lot of fiber. And what our latest research is showing is that you need the combination. And then you get an even greater effect. We we tried a study where we just gave the pure flavonoid content and we didn't see the same effect. But when you give it with the fiber, that's where you see the effect. And, and I'm just going to go back because I'm still staggered by the, 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 the data, the numbers that you've mentioned. So um, 35% less chance of dying, I suppose, in women if they're having an apple a day. 35% as a result of, um, of, the, yeah, of the, the it just, it's just, it's a, it's a mind-blowing number. It's, mm-hmm. it's hard to... Um, it's hard to imagine. Why do we? Why are we all not mandatorily walking around with an apple in our, our backpack? And it's crazy. Well, isn't it? This is why we're trying to promote our research because we think you know there's great translational potential here. And yeah. also, I suppose one of the reasons that we tested all these apples and working with the WA breeding program because if we are concentrating on these high flavonoid apples, and these are what people are eating, then the potential benefits are huge, aren't they? Mm. Oh, look, it, it's, I, I find that, that absolutely fascinating. I was going to ask you, I did mention it um, in, in the lead-in, but um, it, it, is, there an, is there an effect on apples when they're stored for a longer period of time? Do they, do they have a decline in, in the intensity of flavour? Was that part of your research or is there any knowledge with regards to that? I'm not sure with the flavour. So with the flavonoids itself, we yeah. have looked at that and there is no decline or a very small decline because flavonoids themselves are relatively stable compounds. Okay. So they actually produce by a plant in response to stress. So, you know, sunlight, yep. the plant produces flavonoids to protect itself. And that's one of the reasons it's protective when we eat it. Okay, so definitely an apple a day is absolutely mandatory. I know I, I talk with uh, with men and tomatoes and say, look, I know a tomato a day because of the lycopene that's sitting in the tomato um, is exceptionally important to men. Um, and there's a lot of research that supported that with regards to prostate health. Um, but I hadn't heard this story about apples. I'd heard all the, the myths, if you like, that, that uh, we hadn't seen the proof for, but that is just fascinating. And the other thing I find fascinating is that... Um, what you're basically suggesting is that by having an apple in some way, if you're suffering from hypertension or any sort of stress that's related, it's probably going to help bring your stress levels down too. Certainly hypertension. So yeah. it will help. I'm not sure how much it will bring it down by, but one of the studies that we did conduct was in people with risk factors for heart disease. So they either had a high blood pressure or high cholesterol or were slightly overweight and we gave them the apples to eat for four weeks and we did see improvements in their blood vessel health. So we measure this by blood pressure, but we also look at the dilation of a blood vessel, so yeah. how elastic it is. Wow, that's, um, that's a fascinating body of research you've done. Where, where does this go? Where do, where do you take this, this information into the future? How is it going to be used? 
So, well, the release of high flavonoid apples onto the market, and we will continue our clinical trials to test the effect of flavonoids and which specific ones are beneficial. Mm -hmm. And we are also looking at groups worldwide who have data on dietary intake and then follow people up over a number of years and to see what they're dying from and to see how much the apples and the flavonoids are reducing the risk of all those different diseases. So that's work that we're currently focusing on now. Catherine, I have two pink ladies in my uh, in my garden. I think I'm going to put another couple in this winter when it's time to plant apple trees again. An apple I a day really is that. good for you, right? That's yes, fantastic. Absolutely. Yep. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. That that's a well, really thank fascinating you for having me. And I hope that we can stay in touch and that as you uh, as maybe you learn more about some of those flavonoids and the, the different types, um, that as that research goes on, that we can continue to share this information because it really is fascinating. And I really do appreciate you taking the time to join us. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Trevor. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Wow, that is a really interesting story. I, I just can't believe that, you know, you could reduce death in women by 35% by just increasing or just adding an apple a day into your diet. Ladies out there, particularly ladies, um, but I'm sure it applies to men as well, make sure you get into uh, into your local fruit and veg store and get hold of some apples. So that's seven that you need to have each time you go shopping if you shop once a week and you'll be laughing. That is just amazing research. I'm so fascinated by that. Now, we do have... Um, uh, a number of people joining us. Uh, we've got uh, somebody from uh, who's joined us from YouTube. We can't see your name actually, but you've joined us in from Dallas in the US, which is just sensational. Hello to you over there. I'm not sure how good my gardening advice is going to be for Dallas, but uh, throw throw your questions at us. Make sure you let us know um, what it is we can do to help. That's what we're here to do. Jenny is from Southern Queensland, so we've gone. Uh, We've gone into some warmer conditions up there. Where do I find the best resource for pruning a mature apple tree that's never been pruned? That's hard to imagine. But the thing with apple trees is they're not terribly difficult to actually prune. So very much the theory of pruning a tree like that is to get a bit of a vase shape. So pruning the middle branches out of the tree and encouraging it to grow like that does a couple of things. One of them is that it makes it easier for you to pick fruit from the outside and you're not having to climb inside the tree to be able to do that. But also the light coming in is very good for the health of the tree. So there's a few different things that you can do. Be aware that uh, this, so this generally is as a, a rule of thumb, apples fruit off second year wood. Okay, so the spurs, the little fruiting spurs, that will produce flowers in the spring and then fruit is second year wood. Um, but there is one exception to that that I'm aware of, and it's Pinkabell, which is a type of, um, it's a type of, it's a, it's a sport of uh, Pink Lady. Uh, you'll find it in gardens. It's a lot bigger apple itself than Pink Lady, and the tree itself is a dwarf tree. So it gets to about, should only get to about two and a half, three metres maximum. I've definitely got a couple that are at three metres at the moment. Um, that is one tree that you never prune. And the reason you don't prune it is it fruits off the first year wood. So you don't want to be cutting that off, otherwise you'll affect your crop. Whereas if you're getting second year wood, you can actually prune all the, the new soft leader growth back and encourage those that older wood to produce those flowers that will produce the fruit and then let it grow new fresh wood during the growing season. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a strategy. Now, there are some great books that you can get your hands on. And there is a fantastic one by a guy named John Cushney. Now, poor old John's not with us anymore. He was a, one of the world's great garden experts, an Irishman, and uh, when it comes to his advice on pruning apples, and you can still get his books probably in your local bookstore, maybe online, check out Dimmick, somebody like that, and they'll be able to help you out, I'm sure. But John Cushney, and uh, it is Pruning um, by John, and it's a fantastic book. It's one that I've always loved. And uh, let's just keep moving on. I hope that helps you, uh, Jenny. And Manon in Melbourne, can you grow a fig in a pot? Absolutely, Manon, you can. And what will happen with that fig is that you'll find the pot will actually constrict the root growth and as a consequence, it'll constrict the size of the tree itself. So you should have a small tree that will produce lots and lots of fruit. 
So, uh, yeah, and uh, if you're talking about the ideal size pot for a fig, my recommendation would be a half wine barrel. It's always a good sort of standard size, which is about a five or 600 mil wide by about probably 600 mil in depth as well, I would say. Um, very, very good way to grow a fig if you're going to, to do it. Tennille is in Pen... Uh, Penshurst in Victoria. Hello, Tennille. Uh, you've planted 80 emerald gem thuya conifers. Okay. Any particular fertilizers you should use? Well, if they're freshly in the ground, I wouldn't do any feeding at all. Nothing. And the reason is, is that conifers can be a little sensitive to plant food or to, to um, some plant food when the roots are first establishing. Once they're actually established, you can feed them quite regularly and you should always use a controlled release plant food. So something like Osmocote is a great way to go. I would suggest you really think about that. We've got a question coming in from New Zealand, from Wellington. I love Wellington. It's a beautiful part of the world. They say it's windy and I know it can be, but it is absolutely beautiful. There's a botanical garden on the top of the hill that overlooks Wellington that is to die for. If you get a chance to go and see it, make sure you do it. Where she lives is a bit of a microclimate. It's either too hot or it's too cold. So you've been struggling to grow gardenias. Now, I would be a bit of a hypocrite if I was to say to you that you probably shouldn't grow them because the climate is not necessarily um, the right climate. Because I have this habit of collecting plants from all over the world and growing them in my Perth garden. And I grow things like cherries that really just shouldn't be growing um, where I live, right alongside mangoes that are probably also on the edge of whether you should be growing them or not. But I do, and I find ways to make it work. And that's really the message I'm going to say to you here, Dee, is that if you can find a way, you can find a location where you can get warmth uh, on a consistent basis and you can get your mineral nutrient level right. And that, in the case of gardenias, is making sure that you've got um, something like magnesium sulfate. That's a really important additive into soils for gardenias. That should keep them growing pretty well. They don't like it too cold. They don't mind it too hot, but they don't like drying out. So those are a little bits, little bits of advice I, I'm gonna give you at the moment. I, I'm so thrilled. This is actually our first question from New Zealand. We previously had a question in from Canada in a previous episode, but it's lovely to have you joining us from New Zealand. So thank you. And remember, you know, give us a like. If you're watching today or you're subscribed to our YouTube page, give us a like. Let us know that you're enjoying what we're doing. Now, last week uh, I was left to uh, literally I was hung out to dry normally on a Friday evening I would get to have a nice glass of red with a good mate of mine and he was I don't know he's in a hurry apparently to take his uh, lovely lady out for uh, for Valentine's Day so his Friday night was a romantic evening that he didn't want to spend with all of us clearly of course the person I'm talking about is David Van Berkel from <laughs> Garden Express David how are you going sorry for giving you a hard time mate you're terrible Trevor you know that you're not the first person to tell me that. We we too had a week of lockdown, you know, and it's good to escape after that. Even though we've had more experience than you at it, uh, <laughs> yeah, I had a hard week last week. So off the wines for a bit. Well, look, you know what? I, I'm hearing from uh, from Rowan and the team there that you're actually out on the tools. You're in the paddock doing all the hard work at the moment too. At the moment, I'm, I'm doing a fair bit of that. I, I feel like I'm getting younger as I get older, Trevor, and uh, getting a bit more hands-on. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, fun. it's a bit of fun. So what have you been doing? You've been digging bulbs, I take it? Uh, I've been doing a little bit more of the, the grading side of the bulbs, um, working with some specialised machinery that we've got and yeah. uh, doing the counting and the processing of, uh, of the bulbs with a team of uh, probably about 12 uh, just on that floor doing that. So it's really good to be working with them and seeing how hard they are, are you know, putting things together for us in, in a, a hotter warehouse on those warmer days. And, yep. and we, we put a few late nights together. So, um, yeah, we put the wine aside, got the work done, and uh, well, and it's good to be back. That's the other thing I've heard is that you guys are working like crazy. There's at least two shifts running every single day almost at the moment, isn't there? Yeah, at the moment it is. You know, we want to uh, we want to get this all packed up. There's unprecedented demand yet again. Um, you know, I think the uh, COVID's created more gardeners. And and I love your comments just then about um, you know trying something different. 
experimenting and, and just playing in the garden because it is just a wonderful thing, uh, you know, to experience, you know, what the garden can bring to your life. David, when I was when I was a young young fellow, and I, I was uh, I, I did a radio program, a talkback radio program over here in Perth, and uh, you know, I, I suppose you you taught the textbook things, and there was some textbook things that I'd been taught, and I always remember one day I was on radio, and this chap rang up, and he said, "I've got a coconut palm growing in my front yard now. Coconuts, you know, the rule is they will not grow in a place where the temperatures get below ten degrees Celsius, and it's got to do with the ground temperature, the roots of the plant. They just can't handle it, and they won't grow." And for, for us in Western Australia, that would mean you would have to drive five hours north of Perth before you could start to grow coconuts. So I knew there was no way that this guy was able to grow coconuts. So I said to him, no, look, I'm, I'm sure it's not a coconut palm. And he said, look, I'll, I'll tell you, come around my house after the radio show and have a look. And I drove up his driveway and sure enough, right in the middle of his driveway, I had one of those driveways that went around. In the middle of it was a grove of coconuts growing. And I just about crashed into his hedge and I got out and I walked over and I went, how did you do that? And he said, well, I'm a plumber. And he goes, so what I did was I took a bit of extra copper coil from my hot water system and I looped it around that in the soil. And then I ran it back into the house. And every time somebody turns the hot water on or my daughter has a shower for an hour, the hot water was going through, warming the soil up and those coconuts were growing spectacularly well and producing fruit. And it's just proof that where there's a will, there's a way. Exactly, exactly. Or where there's a still, there's a way. That was going to be my answer to growing some uh, some tropical plants. But <laughs> I turned the still back to its original purpose, Trevor, and I couldn't warm the ground in the garden. So no palms for me. Ne never mind, never mind. It's a bit cooler up where you are too, I've got to tell you. Now, listen, yeah. speaking of cooler, you've got an amazing collection um this is a bulb that i want to get my hands on i i kind of have um this very uh i'm going to say it's an old-fashioned romantic view of how to grow uh crocus the, the bulb the crocus in the garden so i i have a an area of beautiful grass that grows down by my creek and during the winter the grass doesn't grow because it's just too cold so it pretty much sits there and the only thing that would really pop up would be weeds but I would like to interplant crocus bulbs in the grass because I know they will come through during the sort of the cooler, colder time flower. And basically by the time they finish flower, the grass will start growing and I'll be ready to start mowing again. Is that, a, is exactly. that am I am I being a little bit unrealistic? No, there was a year, Trevor, we had a few thousand crocus left over and, and I did exactly that on, on a, a bit of lawn that has a little bit of shade so the grass isn't so spectacular. And, yep. and yeah, just this phenomenal amount of flowers followed by, you know, the grassy leaves. And it is, it's just stunning. So yeah, that is the romantic way to grow them. And they are one of those romantic bulbs. You know, they're very pretty, uh, very special, um, but quite a cool climate bulb. Um, we call yep. them Dutch crocus. There's actually yep. some Siberian crocus in amongst our collection uh, from an even cooler sort of climate. So we wow. call them our specialty crocus. Okay, so so to get the best results for crocus in a home garden environment, um, are they in full sun or are they in shade? Uh, I would say, you know, particularly towards a, a warmer climate, and, and I wouldn't call it a warm climate plant at all. I'd avoid those, yeah. you know, if you're in altitude, uh, you know, in the mountains or the base of the mountains where you've not got that baking plains kind of sun, you, you yep. can give them a, a good go, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. I was going to say, so tell us, they, they, come in, they come in a whole range of colours too, don't they? I've been to your display at, um, at uh, Mifkus and seen crocus in flower then. And I've seen them with, you know, like a beautiful blue or purpley sort of coloured flower with stripes through it. I've seen, you know, deep burgundy colours. I've seen whites. I've seen yellows. They're, they're part of your collection. You've got a whole range, haven't you? Yeah, I think we've got nearly 12 or 15 different varieties. And a couple of my favourites, the, the, the blue one with the white stripes is, uh, is Pickwick. So that's definitely one of my favourites, the stripes yep. up and down, of course. Uh, another one is Yellow Mammoth. It has a little bit of bronze on the bottom of the, of the flower, but you get these wow. super-sized crocus flowers and multiple stems off, off, or multiple blooms off each stem. So uh, those two are in our, in our regular collection. Uh, so, yep. yeah, some real beauties. So, so tell me... 
so now it's time to be buying them and getting them to to be ready to be put into your garden. So so tell me a little bit about the deal. So you've got the crocus collection. It's a pack of twenty, right? Yep. And what is four, that? Four different. Sorry, Trevor. Yeah, four varieties. Uh, five bulbs of each, so a total of twenty for twenty eight dollars forty. So a wow. saving of twenty two percent. And that includes that spectacular pickwick, right? That includes the Pickwick, yeah. And then the specialty collection is usually a little bit more expensive. We're doing that one for the same price. Uh, yeah. and, and some of those are really my favourites. They're like the, the fine wines of the Crocus family, if I may throw that pun in. Um, like there's that. some really spectacular bicolours with, a, with a, the white maybe on the inside of the flower and then the yep. blue on the outside, yep. Outstanding. And so this is a specialty collection. These are some of these varieties that you've been you know, picking the best of the best and slowly breeding them up or, or growing them up in quantities and getting them going. What's the, what's the deal? What deal are you offering with those? That's the same, Chad. We've got four varieties in there. I think white, uh, Cream Beauty, Spring Beauty, um, uh, a couple of others in there for $28.40. Same thing, 20 bulbs, uh, a real bargain. Sorry, so $28.40 and $28.40, is that is that... Right? Is that have you? Did Rowan do his numbers the right way? Uh, possibly he hasn't, but I'm just you know we're going with it, Trevor. We're live. Yeah. I can't change it. So, it is <laughs> get, but get guys, your orders in now, folks. That can't be right. That can't be right. That is that's twenty of these spectacular bulbs for twenty eight dollars forty. That's a twenty percent yeah. saving off your normal price, right? That's correct. That's correct. Yep. And, and it's that, just how something people got right. They they just. You know, a little bit more exquisite, I think, than tulips. Uh, they're, they're very easy to grow, probably one of the easiest to grow as long as you, you pick that cooler part of your garden uh, and, and absolutely they love the cooler climates as well. Now, now, yeah, I was going to say, in the cooler part of the garden, beautiful. I've got some growing under the shade of a, a couple of sort of mature-ish trees that pretty much nothing actually really grows under there, but they grow really well in the leaf litter underneath in the garden beds at the base there. They're fantastic. Yeah, look, I think if you can get your, um, you know, your summer shade uh, on your deciduous trees, that really helps spring flowering bulbs because it, it avoids that ground temperature that you talk about. So it's not so much the air temperature. So planting yep. a little bit deeper, having summer shade uh, and then a little bit more sun in the cooler months of the year uh, as they yep. come up, that's the cool spell that they require to give you good flowers. Okay, okay. Now, David, I know that if I let you get off here... Um, without me placing my order, um, there'll be nothing left. So you've got to make sure that you, the, the specialty collection, you've got to put at least two packs to one side for me and the general crocus collection with the pickwick in it, you've got to have at least two packs for me as well, all right? I'm placing my order direct with you. Absolutely, done. Uh, consider it organised and we'll Thank have you. them shipped out to you already next week, Trevor. And this is the great thing about Garden Express. So people can place their order with you online now and you'll be shipping in a week's time. Yeah, we've started our um, our spring bulb shipping already this week. A lot of the pre-orders are, are heading out. Another week yep. or so, we'll be we'll be doing all of the current orders that uh, that we've been putting the offers out for. So uh, the time is nigh. D David, that is absolutely sensational. The crocus collections. There's two fabulous crocus collections. I can't recommend them um, strongly enough. They are really beautiful. I think you said. They're, they're, the, you know, they're the next step up from tulips, and I tend to think they are too. I, I just love them in, in my garden. And, and you're right, even in Perth, just growing them in a cooler part of the garden um, delivers fantastic results. So I will be definitely putting those in. And, folks, you've got to be making sure you get your orders in with David because I'm sure... I am sure, like most of the things that we've been, do, you know, we've been seeing happen with these these offers, they will sell out in no time. It's it's really crazy. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So yes, definitely get in get in early. David Van Berkel, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend, mate. It might be time to go and test one of those slightly red um, drinks that I know that you do have on a Friday night. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. So, folks, make sure you get your order in uh, with gardenexpress.com.au if you want to get your hands on those crocus. They are a spectacular plant. Absolutely fantastic. Now, we have got a bunch of questions coming through, and that's what I'm here to do is to help answer your, your questions. And um, I really do appreciate you joining us this evening and spending um, 
spending some time with us. Now, I. I have been corrected just before I answer your questions. I do have to make sure Lockie is he's taken over and he's really bossing me around. I did want to make sure I mentioned this. This is my plant of the week and uh, you will know them. These are the beautiful crepe myrtles. It's a couple of different types here. This is the more common lavender. Um, and then this one is a, a absolutely beautiful one from uh, Fleming's Nursery, one of their collection, their um, Indian summer collection. And there's some spectacular ones. And of course, there's my friends out at um, Touch of Class who also have the black foliage collection as well. So um, the diamonds in the dark range. Now, this is the time of the year when you'll see the flower and they are absolutely stunning. And they're gonna flower for, well, probably another two or three weeks, depending on where you are in the country. And then, about four weeks after that, the foliage all goes this beautiful coppery bronze colour and it'll hold until probably June when they'll drop all the foliage and reveal the bark. And the bark is mottled up and down a mature crepe myrtle and it's absolutely stunning. And if you want to get the best effect, uh, having one near the house and up lighting underneath it, putting light up over the bark at night makes it a stunning feature. Absolutely amazing. So my plant of the week has got to be uh, crepe myrtles. And, and one of the things I will say to you is for those of you that live in dry climates, um, good news is crepe myrtles come from, uh, most of the varieties anyway, come from India and uh, they love hot, dry conditions. Uh, when you are in cooler climates, they can be a little susceptible to getting powdery mildew, which is like a, a fungal disease of the foliage. But there are varieties now that are resistant or tolerant of that particular disease and perform far better. And the best place to get your advice on the best variety for your situation is your local garden centre. If you're talking to your local garden centre, you can't go wrong. So I hope that that uh, that is an inspiration for you. If you're looking for a beautiful small tree, crepe myrtles, there's a whole lot of different varieties, including those black foliaged um, diamonds in the dark. Uh, they are just amazing. Oh, how are we going? Let's have a look. We've got a few questions coming through. Um, we've got Snappy has joined us. Um, I think this is via our YouTube channel. And uh, just, just visit our website. Um, that's the, obviously the Garden Guru's website. And I love it. Thank you, Snappy. That's great. Tanil is in Penhurst in Victoria. Tanil. It's lovely to hear from you and uh, you're very kind. You've said you're such a talented, knowledgeable soul. Thank you so much for sharing your information. It's one of the great pleasures in my life is that I, as you will see in everything that I do when I'm in the garden, I'm really passionate about it. I love, you know, it's just something that runs in my blood. It's in my DNA and I love it. And I'm lucky enough to be able to share that passion with you. So, you know, thanks for those kind words, Tanil. Uh, another one, I think, oh, this is from... Um, from 37 on Dallas. So this is Dallas, uh, I'm, I'm assuming Dallas uh, in Texas. Any advice uh, for growing apples from seed? So apples will grow from seed really well. Actually, they, they'll they grow exceptionally well and they'll generally produce fruit. The risk is, or the, the unknown factor is that uh, it takes somewhere between five and seven years for a seed grown apple uh, to produce fruit. And because the, the flowers have been cross-pollinated, you basically have two parents. So you're gonna have some genetic variability. And we were talking with Catherine earlier on with regards to the different types of apples. Some may be better than others for you, um, or certainly greater intensity anyway of uh, beneficial nutrients. Um, well, this same thing can occur with what's going on with you growing them from seed. So you could end up with a spectacular apple. It could be just like one of the parents, but it might be completely different and it could be good or it could be bad. It might have say a thicker skin and not be quite as enjoyable to eat. It might be a little bitter or sour or uh, it might not be that crunchy. It might be flowery and you like your crunchy apple. So there's a bit of a risk, but the answer is yes, you can grow them. The best way to do it is actually to plant your seed right now. So February in Australia is a terrific time to get apple seed into the ground. And basically what will happen is it'll germinate. It'll get to about that big by winter time and then it'll go dormant. But come springtime, it'll really take off. And at that point, you'll get a really good year of strong growth. And um, that's why it's not a bad time of the year to be uh, planting your apples. I hope that helps. Um, but do be careful uh, because you can get enormous variability 
and uh, it would be very disappointing after five years to grow something from seed only to be disappointed with the fruit that you've got, which is one of the reasons why we always grow, you know, select cultivars that have been grafted onto a good rootstock from our local garden centre. And my advice is that I would do that. Find the apple you love and plant it in your garden. Now, Cherie is from Bunyip. Hello, Cherie. Um, lovely to have you join us again this week. I know you do follow us, which is great. You've had to plant out two passion fruit vines that you've grown from seed and they've outgrown their little pots. Fingers crossed that they'll be okay as it's quite hot there in Bunyip. Well, you know what? They love it hot. Absolutely love it. And as a general comment, I'm going to say this about uh, people growing passion fruit in WA, is that it's better to grow uh, seedling passion fruit. Uh, but if you're in Victoria or Tasmania or somewhere where it gets pretty cool during the winter months, you're often better to grow to, to get the grafted varieties. Now, the reason uh, you're better is because the rootstock is called corula. It's a blue flowering passion fruit that comes from very high up in the Andes in South America. And um, it grows well in cold conditions. In sandy soils, in hot climates, that can sucker. So you can start seeing little growth c come out underneath the graft. And often that growth will quickly outgrow the top plant, the one that you actually want for its fruit. Um, and you'll end up with this strange um, little five-leafed um, or five uh, leaflet um, leaved passion fruit that produces blue flowers and no fruit, and you'll be disappointed. So in cooler climates, definitely go for the grafted ones. In warmer climates, definitely look at growing them from seed. You cannot go wrong. They'll do okay, Cherie. I think you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Maz is in Ipswich, Queensland. It must be passion fruit week. It's got a green passion fruit. How do I tell when it's ready? When the fruit falls, um, it isn't the colour that it's meant to be. It's, is it, it's supposed to stay green. Now, I could be wrong, but I think that the passion fruit variety you're talking about here, Maz, is one of the tropical passion fruits that, that are actually sort of a greener sort of fruit and generally quite a large fruit too. Um, the black passion fruit, if it's the smaller black passion fruit, they will eventually turn black. Sometimes they'll be quite green right up until the last minute. So the Panama uh, red and Panama gold can be green and not, depending on what the weather conditions are like, not change colour. And that's really got to do with the level of humidity um, as the plant is actually uh, maturing the fruit. There's nothing actually wrong with it. When you actually pick the fruit and you cut it open, it'll taste sweet, just like the passion fruit normally would have done. Uh, it's one of those things. But uh, with passion fruit, there is one thing you can be absolutely certain of, and that is if the fruit falls off, it's ripe. So you can't go wrong that way, I think. Denise, I don't know where you're from. Denise, please, folks, make sure you let us know uh, where you are, where you're based, and um, what we what we will do is be able to ask the question. I'd suggest you're probably in a cooler climate. You could be in uh, New South Wales, in, in sort of... Um, southern New South Wales, uh, most likely you're in Victoria or possibly even WA, you've got a, a weeping mulberry tree. So this is a beautiful ornamental tree. How do I go about pruning a weeping mulberry tree? It's gone crazy. Leave it to winter. Okay, so get to the winter. When the tree has dropped all its foliage, because they're deciduous, they'll do that. You can look at the structure of the tree and you can get the right shape. You can take out branches that are crossing over each other. You can also remove branches that might be shading out other branches and you can get that really lovely shape. But you really can't see it often when the plant is full of foliage and it's growing like crazy. So winter is the time to prune and that's what I would be doing. Teller is in Aberdeen in New South Wales. Hi Teller. Teller is a Big supporter of ours. Thanks for joining us again this week. You've got a lemon myrtle in a pot on the veranda. It's not growing quick enough to keep up with demand. And I'm with you. She loves it sprinkled on everything. What can you do? My lemon myrtle is about um, probably probably almost double my height now. So it's, it's getting quite tall and I'm growing it in the ground. And that's if you really do love that fragrance. Lemon myrtle, by the way, is, um, is a bush tucker plant, I suppose it's a it's a, 
a native that is uh, exceptionally good in drier climates, does like to be watered during the, so it comes from uh, northern New South Wales, southern Queensland. It, it does like to have summer rain, so it does like to have some water during the summer, but it'll grow like crazy and it'll produce lots of foliage. And it's the foliage that's full of that beautiful citrusy uh, aroma and flavour, those oils, and uh, you can do all sorts of things. The, the best cookies ever are uh, uh, cookies that are made with um, lemon myrtle leaves. The flavours are amazing. I'm getting a couple of nods from the guys around here. Michaela's sitting to one side. She's just given us a big love heart. Lockie, however, has screwed his face up, so I might continue on with the next question. Hope that helps, Teller. Rita is in Red Hill in Victoria. Lovely to have you join us, Rita, on this Friday evening. I'm wanting to find an ornamental grapevine. Do you know where I can get some from? Should I be planting them before winter? Um, look, to be quite honest, the, the ornamental grapevines um, now is probably you could plant them now, not really going to do anything. Winter would be when I would be putting a grapevine in, regardless of whether it's ornamental or uh, whether it's a fruiting variety. Um, best place, my first stop, if I was living in Melbourne at the moment, I would be going down to, um, to Garden World, which is a fantastic, absolutely fantastic garden centre <clears throat> and a, an amazing range too of, uh, of, of plants there. Now, let's have a look here and see where we're going to get through as many questions as we can before we finish up. I've got five minutes to go. Elise, I'm not sure where you're from, Elise. How do you water Apothos Gold and Hartley Philodendron and how much for my indoor plants? All right, well, this beautiful glass of water, this pink glass water, um, would be about all it needs once a week. I don't know why everybody around me is giggling suddenly, but lovely flavor too um but the thing with it is that um what you will find is that that's all they'll need in a in a standard pot of a typical sort of 200 mil pot once a week it's not a lot they don't require huge amounts um, and particularly during winter it's actually important in winter to back right off um, the pothos if you do feed it Oh, if you do give it a lot of water and you do feed it, you will encourage a lot of strong growth. There's no doubt about it, but you don't need to give them too much. And the greatest risk is when you've got them in pots and they've got a tray underneath and the, the roots get too wet, you can introduce fungal diseases and that sets them back. And at least thank you for letting us know you're in Melbourne. Um, yeah, my, my suggestion is keep the water down. Uh, there's that fabulous um, pour and feed product from um, the guys. I'm going to show you. Uh, this is actually, this is for those of you that are growing um, cacti and succulents, but there's a version of that for indoor plants. And all you do with this one is you literally pour it straight into the cap and you give that once a week and that's going to probably do the job. Yeah. Um, but never mix the two up. That's really important. Mm. Okay. I, um, I've still got a voice, which is great. Let's keep going. We're heading to the, oh no, we're heading to Jonathan Fung in Perth and he's got a tube stock Japanese maple that's stressed from travel in the mail. Now all the leaves are dried, how do you revive it? Well look, actually, you know what? Repot it straight away into some good potting mix, make sure it stays moist. It will reshoot some foliage before winter and when it goes into dormancy, but the, the trick at the moment is just to get it established in a slightly larger pot and then um, next spring, it'll take off with lots of new growth. And at that point, it's a case of making sure that it doesn't stress, that it doesn't have any water stress and you have it in the right spot. Um, it's really critical with Japanese maples in hot, dry conditions like Perth has um, to, to make sure that you're protecting them. So yeah, repot it now, maybe a little bit of sea salt, seaweed extract, um, helps reduce stress. It's not a fertilizer. It's not going to stress it that way. Do it the world of good. Now, uh, coming from our YouTube channel, the Barmy Army uh, from Hunter Valley. I love it. You guys gave me merry hell last year, not last year, the year before when we were in uh, we were in uh, the UK for uh, for the Australian English uh, cricket test, um, the Ashes, which was spectacular, and. Um, yeah, I happen to end up in the middle of the, the, the Barmy Army, uh, an experience I'll never forget, but it was a lot of fun, not a bad one. Um, your question is an interesting one. I have issues with Asian bugs and fruit fly. Other than pyrethrum and diatomaceous earth,
Is there anything else effective on these bugs? Certainly Dynamatious Earth is a very effective way of, of getting control of uh, any of those sort of shell, uh, any of those carapace kind of um, insects. It, and the way it works is it's uh, highly absorbent, breaks the shell, sucks some moisture out of them, and it will break them up. Um, it, it is also natural. It's important to understand that that is natural. Pyrethrum, there are synthetics and there are natural pyrethrums. Um, probably not as effective. The, the control for fruit fly, I think now in Australia, that's really going to be the go-to in the future is probably success. So the active ingredient in that being spinosad is, uh, is probably the, the, the real solution. Albeit there is a lot of combinations, so baiting and things like that, they're all different options for you. Um, yeah, I, try and keep it natural is my advice. That's the best way to go. And uh, remember, whatever we spray, anything that we consume uh, with, uh, there's a high likelihood we're going to ingest that into our system. And that's not good for you. So wherever you can use natural things to control pests, particularly predatory insects, which uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of as well, um, it's a lot better way to go than it is to be, uh, you know, pouring chemicals all over your plants. Just my point of view, some people like a quick solution and that's okay. It's up to you, but that's my thought processes. Now, Steve's in Perth. What's my recommendation on fertilizing zygo cactus? Well, it's actually this, Steve. This is actually one of the best things I've seen. It's pre-mixed. So you literally just take the cap and for a standard 200 mil pot, which is pretty typical of what a zygo cactus would grow in, you just give one of these once a week. And between now and probably May, when you'll get masses and masses of flower production, um, it would be the best thing you could ever do. So that's this pour and feed. I think it was the product of the year last year in Australia this as year. far as, oh, this year. Um, so, you know, spectacular um, product. You can't go wrong because it's all been pre-mixed. So it's not like you can burn it because you, you made it too strong or, or it wasn't enough. It's absolutely pre-mixed perfect. Good way to go, Steve. I hope that helps. Rachel's in South Australia. My indoor plants are getting black marks on the leaves and then dying. Now, what is this and how do I stop this spreading to other plants? This is a classic example of, of one of those things that we talk about all the time. So if you were to ask what kills plants, it's generally too much love, not enough love. Too much love is generally reflected in feeding too much and watering too much. And when you're getting black marks on the leaves and then the plant starts to rot, it's a classic example of watering too much. So remember this, this glass full, yeah, that's, that's a better level. Um, that per week is all they're going to need. I can't work it out, but the producers are shaking their heads at me. Um, but that will help. So you're, you're just, at the moment, what you're doing, Rachel, is giving them too much water. There's no doubt. I've got Michael joined us from YouTube in Goulburn in Canberra. Thanks very much, Michael, for joining us. There are, a, there are lots of rhubarb stories, some more right than others, but it doesn't matter. Please tell us your reckoning on rhubarb. Well, I grow rhubarb at home. Um, I love the plant. Absolutely fantastic. And I love rhubarb itself particularly in um there's a, it's a fantastic flavor i love it in uh, in desserts the downside um of rhubarb is the amount of work you have to go through to actually get those beautiful flavors coming through and if you're willing to do it no problems at all in my situation full sun they're protected from wind really important and um, this is a perennial plant so the older it gets the more Obviously, leaves you'll get, the bigger the leaves are and the better the stems are. Uh, with regards to colour, doesn't matter. So if it's a, if it's red or the stem's green, it's not good or bad for you. It's all okay. It'll be fine. So I hope that helps. And uh, if you want a little trick with regards to getting the best growth results, it's controlled release fertilisers. That's really, really important. And uh, we've got a couple of Oh, we've got a bit of uh, speculation going on here. The Barmy Army, who are generally pretty well qualified on issues such as uh, coloured water. Uh, Barmy Army thinks that could be pea flower gin. No way. Maybe. Um, look, that's it. That's all we've got for you tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. It's always great catching up. I love spending time and I love answering your questions. So I really appreciate you quite seriously taking the time to join us this evening. Ask your questions. We will be reaching out to the winners of today's prizes um, 
a little bit later on, not not too much later on. I think Lockie is going to be sending some notes out to say thanks very much um, and congratulations, and you'll be getting some fantastic uh, packet seeds turning up in the mail. The Garden Guru's autumn season commences on Channel 9 on the February the 27th, so we're not far away. We're only a week away. And uh, remember, if you if you want to, if you've got some questions and or maybe you want to do some research, a, a great resource is our website. It's always so good. And you can always catch up on previous stories from the Garden Gurus. And you can also watch them as well as far as videos go from our YouTube channel. And I hope you do do that. You can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcast and Podbean. And that's it. That's all we've got for you this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. As I said, I really love your involvement. I love the opportunity to interact. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again on Friday at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time. That uh, is 4 o'clock over here in the West. Happy gardening. Have a spectacular weekend. I'm Trevor Cochran. We'll see you later. Visit the Garden Guru's online store and browse through a collection of high-quality, German-made wolf garden tools. You'll also find a range of books with information to help create and maintain a beautiful garden. You can also access the online store on the Garden Guru's Facebook page 